k. Uh, so, we are looking at uh, knowledge representation and I want to introduce a new dimension to representation now, which is what do you do if you want to reason about change. So, so far we have not really talked about a changing world essentially. We have said okay, this is how we describe the world, this is how we describe the relations between elements of the world and so on, but we have not really given some thought to that when the world is changing, how do we represent that and how do we talk about that essentially. So, for example, uh, I might say that John is happy or Peter is happy let us say. Uh, and that is a statement I can make happy Peter in the simplest ad hoc way of representing things. And then I say Mary hit Peter essentially. And then I want to say after that Peter is no longer happy essentially. So, how do I represent change here? How do I capture the fact that certain things are true at certain point of time, but not true at a different point of time. So, so far we have not even talked about time essentially and we want to look at a mechanism for doing that and the mechanism that we are looking at is called event calculus. We will focus on the representation part today. The reasoning especially in an open world is a little bit more complex because we do not know what else is happening. Uh, we will come to reasoning uh, when I have when we have looked at some some ways of handling uncertainty essentially. So, this event calculus was proposed by Kowalski and Sergeot in 1986. Hmm. Robert Kowalski was one of the uh, people who has done a lot of work in logic and reasoning and he is one of the founders of uh, the idea of logic programming which we will look at uh, maybe in a few more lectures. <laughs> but there is an interesting tutorial by somebody called Shanahan. And we will put up this tutorial uh, along with the other material, so that you can actually read read about this event calculus and this essentially. Hmm. There are other variations which people have talked talked about. So, for example, McCarthy and all they talked about something called situational calculus. But for our purpose it's, it suffices if we look at one flavor and then we can imagine what the other is like essentially. Hmm. Now, in some sense event calculus is a higher order logic. And when we say higher order we mean higher than first order logic essentially. So, if you remember our notion of first order logic is that predicates take, ter take terms as arguments and they are basically defined relations between elements in the domain. Now, in this event calculus we will take those predicates themselves as arguments essentially. So, we may want to say that happy John is true or happy John is false and things like that essentially. So, in that sense it is a higher order calculus essentially. Now, when we talk about logics people, people often talk about typed systems or typed calculus or some people use the term many sorted. logics. So, what essentially we are talking about is things like sorts. So, sorts is a noun here, it represents it is just another word for typed essentially. And people have explored languages in, you in which you separate things of different types essentially. So, for example, we might say type human is one thing, type number we have already introduced a notion of a number essentially. So, that is a different type of an object altogether essentially. So, people like to sometimes 
break up languages into many sorted languages or many types of languages of many sorts of objects essentially. This event calculus which we will uh, use the term E c it uses three sorts of or three types of things essentially. So, one is of sort time or one is of type time and we will use notation p 1, p 2 and so on to represent time essentially or we can use upper case it does not matter. Then the second sort is of type fluence. So, by fluence basically we mean predicates in FOL essentially. So, and things like that. We use the term fluence for those predicates which are amenable to change, which could change essentially. So, it may be that Peter is happy now, he may be happy at a, at a different, may not be happy at a different time point. So, such predicates which can change we will call as fluence essentially. So, in general we will call actually all predicates as fluence essentially. And then the third type is events or you might say actions. So, for example, hit, move, eat, anything which is an action or an event, uh, we will is the third type essentially. Now, you can see that 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 both these fluent types and event types are defined on the domain. The predicates are defined on the domain and actions are also defined on the domain. So, if you say if you have an action let us say you continue using the the feature hit Mary Peter, it is defined on a domain in which Peter and Mary are objects and there is some relation that we, we have defined as hit. Only thing is now we are separating relations for example, brother Peter Mary if I had said it is a relation which is on the domain essentially and it is really a relation in the true sense of the word essentially. Whereas, hit Mary Peter we have modeled so far as a relation in the domain. Remember that the semantics of binary predicates is that they are subsets of d cross d. So, it is just some relation mathematical relation, but eventually we would like to think about that as a separate for from a descriptive relation like brother to and something which describes an action or an event essentially. So, the event calculus separates events and actions from relations of the other kind which we call as fluence and this we will call as events or actions essentially. Hmm. So, let us talk about the kind of predicates or vocabulary in event calculus essentially. What are the predicate names that. So, we will have a well defined set of predicates which we will use essentially. So, this first one is called happens. Okay, so, I um, do not remember whether I have stated this here, but fluence uh, we will denote by symbols like f 1, f 2 and so on and events and actions we will denote by symbols like E 1, E 2 and so on. So, whenever we say E 1, E 2 we are talking about the type event, whenever we say F 1, F 2 we are talking about type fluent and whenever we say T 1, T 2 we are talking about type time essentially. So, the, the, the first predicate that we are interested in is say that 
so this says event e happened starting at t1 and ending at t2 you can see that this is a durative action which means it has a duration associated with it otherwise we could have talked about something like happens e at time t if actions are instantaneous then we can say that uh, if you are modeling act actions as instantaneous then we could have simply said the event e has happened at time t if you want to model model the duration of actions then we will say even happens even e starting at t1 and ending at t2 essentially but this is one predicate that we will use which is happens then we have holds at some fluent at time t so this stands for the fact that fluent f is true at time t so ob so observe that already fluent has become an argument to this predicate that holds that so which is why we can think of this as a higher order uh, language essentially so these are the two basic predicates the first predicate says that some event has happened at certain time or maybe from over a certain time duration the second one allows us to say that something is true at a given time essentially hmm. then of course we want to find connections between things so the predicate that we are interested in is called initiates and the meaning of this predicate is that if e happens at time t and we could talk about derivative actions here but let's just keep it simple then f becomes true strictly speaking f becomes true not at time t but just after time t essentially so depending upon whether you are talking about discrete event calculus or continuous event calculus you have this notion of causality that this event is causing that fluent to become true so strictly speaking it it becomes true after that essentially so if you are talking about discrete event calculus then essentially what you mean is that if event e happens at time t then fluent f becomes true at time t plus 1 but we will not go into the detail at this moment essentially then we have terminates e f t which is similar to initiates but instead it becomes false essentially so initiates and terminates are two predicates that we will use to say that this event is causing this to become true okay. so our knowledge base for example might say that if somebody hits somebody else then that somebody else becomes uh, stops being happy essentially so continuing with our study of predicates we have a predicate called released at so we are saying so we are talking about handling uncertainty we are trying to see how can we model uncertainty here essentially in the sense that sometimes we don't know what will be the value of a fluent essentially so for example if we have a coin and you toss it up essentially then you don't know whether it's going to be two heads or whether it's going to be tails or something like that and things like that essentially so release that is one attempt to being able to model uncertainty and this predicate says that fluent f is released 
from what we call as the common sense So, we have this notion of a common sense law of inertia, which basically says that if something was true, it will continue to remain true, if something was false, it continues to remain false, except when we want to model certain kinds of uncertainty. Then we say that this fluent has been released from the common sense law of inertia, which means that if it has been released from the common sense law of inertia of time t, then after that you cannot state whether it is true or whether it is false essentially. Hmm. This is a little bit like Schrodinger's kitten essentially. So, so, if you know about that, you do not know whether it is going to be true or false essentially. So, you cannot determine what is the state. So, even whether if you, you even you may have started with a certain state, but once you are released from the common sense law of inertia you do not know what the what the value is whether it is true or false essentially and this is used to model some kinds of uncertainty. We will come back to this maybe a, a little bit later sometime. Then we have releases, how does it get releases, how does it get released an event can release it essentially. So, we can say that event E releases S. So, for example, tossing a coin, we may try to model the process of tossing a coin by saying that it is released from the law of we do not know whether it is heads or tails anymore, but of course, that we will also see that this will not really serve a purpose because eventually the outcome of tossing a coin should be either heads or tails essentially. And, and releasing it does not really serve that purpose, but that is the first attempt at trying to do that essentially. But there are other examples, for example, if you are addicted to playing Russian roulette, which uh, is not a good thing to get addicted to of course, uh, which is a game in which you have a revolver with let us say one or two bullets and you spin it randomly and then you fire it at yourself. I mean, it is a it is something that you do not want to imagine, but anyway that is a game. So, if you are spinning that barrel, then you are releasing it from the law of inertia. You do not know at the end of it whether it is going to be uh, uh, loaded or not loaded essentially. Hmm. And then there is another thing called trajectory. So, I just very briefly say that if F 1 becomes true at time T 1, then F 2 becomes a function of T 2, which you can describe in, in because it is after all a predicate. Right. F 2 is also a predicate or a fluent essentially. So, as an example, if F 1 is uh, uh, let us say on the stove, if you kept a pan of water on the stove or something like that, then F 2 could be temperature as a function of F 2 as a function of T 2. At the moment you put a pan of water on a stove, its temperature will now depend on the on, on time essentially. So, so that is given described by this predicate called trajectory essentially. Then we have some shortcuts. So, for example, you might say 
that clipped fluent between T1 and T2. It is a shortcut for saying some event happened, E happened. and made f falls during t 1 to t 2. So, I am not writing the logical expression, you can actually write a logical expression for this that there exists an event e and there exists a time t such that event e happened at time t and terminate this fluent f essentially. So, I am not writing that, I am just writing a English version which says that some event E happened which made the fluent false at time t essentially. And there is another one called uh, D clipped which is opposite of, of clipped in the sense that it, it made it true essentially. And then there is one more called persist between. So, we can say that between time t 1 a fluent persists and t 2 a fluent persists, which means it was not clipped and not released between time t 2. In between t 1 and t 2 essentially. So, when we say that at a fluent f persists from time t 1 to t 2, we are essentially saying that nothing has made it false, which means no event has made it which terminated that, that fluent from being true and also it was not released during this time period essentially. So, nothing happened which released it from the common sense law of energy here. Then we are asserting that that persists between t 1 and t 2 essentially. Okay. Then we have uh, the axioms of event calculus. Hmm. One thing that I could have mentioned is uh, that when we were talking about holes at, when we are talking about holes at, we can add another predicate called initially. which is equivalent to saying holds at f t 0, where t 0 is some starting time essentially. So, initially uh, just a short form again, uh, you could have just used holds at time t 0, but typically we would say initially that in the beginning that was the case essentially. So, there are a certain set of events that uh, axioms of E c that we use to describe the effects of which, which are basically used to reason about change. So, these axioms are called let us say E c 1, this says that if E a time t and that if a event E happens at time t and if we know from the domain that it that E initiates f, then we can infer that holds at f at time t. So, there is one way of figuring out what is true essentially. So, if some event has happened which, which makes this particular fluent true, then we can infer that this fluent has become true. Is similar, but we have terminates here and then we have not holds it. Then we have E C 3 
if there is an event which has happened, see now we are making a distinction between the facts that events have to happen, only then their effects are seen essentially. So, we are saying that if an event E has happened at time t and if we know that this event will release uh, the fluent f at time t, then we can say that it has been released at time t essentially. Now, we are saying that if an event E happens and it either initiates the fluent F or it terminates the fluent F, then it is no longer released at. That the fluent is no longer random essentially. Now, that an event E has happened which either makes it true or, which, or it makes it false then it must be true or false, it is no longer a random variable essentially. Okay. So, these are the basic, this is a basic language of event calculus. Now, reasoning in event calculus is not such a straightforward thing, we have to worry about the fact that we do not know what all happened and we do not know what are the effects of what all has been happened, if, if our description of the world is open or it is not complete. And then we have to take recourse to some slightly more sophisticated forms of reasoning that we will come to later. But I want to just illustrate uh, something which is a well known example which is called the Yale shooting problem. Hmm? So, I will urge you to go to the web and search for this and you will find a nice description of this essentially. But the way Yale shooting problem is as follows. So, let me do this on a separate page. It kind of illustrates uh, this uh, language. So, if we have a statement which says that it is a proportional language. We, are, we do not have variables, so you can imagine what we are talking about. Uh, one of the actions is called load and one of the fluents is loaded and we say that if you load, then it loaded becomes true. So, we are talking about a gun as you can imagine, it is a shooting problem. Hmm. Then we say that initiates so that's another action so that's another fluent so we say that if you shoot then that becomes true so, obviously, we are talking about someone or something, but it is not unconditional, it is only if the gun is loaded essentially, which means if the gun is loaded and if you shoot, then that will become true at time t essentially, and you can say likewise. That is another predicate or another fluent. So, with these three statements, we have described the domain. So, our domain is very simple. If you if you do the action load, then the gun will become loaded. If the gun is loaded and if you shoot somebody, then that person will be there. So, it is a very simple domain here. And then here is the 
narrative it says that initially align remember that this is a short form for holds at time t0 then happens load at time t1 happens and see suddenly we have introduced an action called sneeze we have not said anything about what is the effect of sneeze and things like that but we have simply said that there is an action called sneeze and it has happened at time t2 essentially And then we ask something which I have not stated which you will have to state which is that T 1 is before T 2 is before T 3 is before T 4. These are also separate statements that you have to make uh, each of them individually T 1 is less than T 2, T 2 is less than you know that kind of a stuff. Essentially. So, the jail shooting problem basically says this initially a lie was true then the gun was loaded then a sneeze happened and then the shoot action happened and the question we are asking is is it true that that will be true after a time t4 or which which is equivalent to saying is it true that a lie will be false at time t4 essentially now the problem with trying to come to a conclusion here is that we do not know what are the effects of sneeze we do not know, we have not stated this. If you have not stated this, what is the inference you can make essentially? So, we will come to this later. So, the default incident, the default inference that we would like to make is that sneezing does not affect the status of the gun essentially, but who knows you know that that sneezing could have somehow unloaded the gun essentially. So, in some strange world that you live in, if you sneeze, then the gun, gun goes off automatically and therefore it is unloaded or something. We have not even stated here that that shooting will make the gun unloaded that could be another domain uh, statement we could we could make. So, there are many things we have not stated essentially. What if we had introduced uh, another action if happens spin at time t 2 essentially. Of course, we have not talked about spin, but we did speak about the Russian roulette uh, incident. So, what if I had introduced a third action which says that that you are spinning the barrel uh, at time t 2 and then you are shooting essentially. Then how do you figure out what, what can you conclude at the end of the day whether the poor victim is dead or alive essentially. So, I have introduced the language here the event calculus language which allows us to talk about events and fluence and the effects that events have on fluence and so on and so forth. So, you can say that if you for example, eating a dosa results in you becoming happy. So, you can make such statements essentially and then you can give a story and ask is John happy or not essentially and then you could come to answers, but things become complicated when the description of the world is incomplete essentially. So, we do not know what is the effect of sneeze and we do not know if spin has actually happened or not. Just because we have stated that these are the four events that have happened does not mean that other things have not happened. So, we have to implicitly make an assumption that the only things that we know are the ones that are stated essentially. And if we can say that that okay, we do not know the effect of sneeze. So, there is no effect of sneeze on, on loaded. We do not know that spin happened. So, spin did not happen and under those assumptions we can say yes if we make those assumptions 
then it is true that the person is dead essentially. But it is only subject to those assumptions and reasoning in an open world forces you to make those assumptions. We will come to this not in the next class, but much later when we look at what is called as default reasoning as to you know how can you make inferences which are default inferences uh, where such assumptions are made essentially which says that everything we know is the only thing that we need to need to know essentially. We will look at mechanisms of that, but that will be towards the end of the course. In the next class, I want to continue with the representation and I want to look at one very commendable effort at representation in which they try to choose a very small set of predicates and talk about everyday actions in the world essentially. Hmm. That is called conceptual <coughs> dependency theory and we will look at that in the next class when we meet.